Yes, let's go. Hi, everyone. Um, welcome to our 34th episode of SEO for Bloggers. Uh, today wow. I know. It's, we're the only one who ever says anything, by the way. Everyone else. <laughs> 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 We're really excited, though, to chat about uh, experience, expertise, authoritativeness, whew, and trust. It's a mouthful. Otherwise known as EAT. Uh, we'll break down strategies today and delve into the details that'll help optimize your online presence, y'all. Y'all. Uh, y'all. <laughs> today, as always, um, our experts, Casey Marquis of MediaWise, Andrew Wilder of NerdPress, Arsene Rabinovich of Top Hat Rank, and a very special guest panelist, Marie Haynes. Hi. Ooh. Hello. <laughs> Ooh. Um, Marie is a well-known SEO expert who's been helping businesses navigate Google's ever-changing algorithms since 2008. She is a recognized leader in the industry, and we're very excited to have her share her extensive knowledge and expertise today. So, Marie, thank you <laughs> for being here. Thanks for having me. It's going to be fun. Absolutely. Uh, just a reminder, before we get started, we're going to be holding the Q&A at the end of this episode. So please uh, be sure to add any questions you'd like to see answered in the Q&A chat below and let us know where you're tuning in from. So we're going to jump right in. Marie, this question is for you. Being an expert on EAT, uh, can you give us a quick overview of what EAT is and how it came to be and its presence in the search quality rater guidelines, please? So EEAT, originally it was just EAT, stands for Experience, Expertise, Authoritativeness, and Trustworthiness. And it's not like it's a score. It's not like Google says, oh, you have an EAT score of uh, you know this much, therefore you get the rank. Rather, what it is, is uh, Google's made um, a list of criteria that they say, if a, if a user is trying to determine if a website's helpful to them, there are certain criteria that make that more likely to be helpful. So for example, if you were looking for medical information, something that would make uh, content more likely to be helpful would be if it was written by a medical professional, perhaps. Um, but that doesn't mean all medical content has to be authored exactly by a medical professional. That's just one of the components. So. Um, uh, EEAT really, uh, if you had to narrow it down to one thing, I, it would be legitimacy. Um, it's Google's way of uh, sort of establishing, are you legitimate enough? Are you trustworthy enough? Are you the type of uh, answer? EAT really is synonymous with quality. Um, used to be in the quality raters guidelines, they, uh, they called it page quality instead of EAT. Um, and so it's much more than just author bios, which I'm sure we'll talk about here. Uh, it's really just overall encompassing quality and the characteristics that go with it. Excellent. Um, how important is EAT now? Should all websites care about it or just health and finance? Everybody should care about it, some more than others and some aspects more than others. Um, the Google has said that EAT is a component of every single query that's done. Every query is evaluated uh, in some terms of, of EAT. And again, it doesn't mean like, oh, if you don't have uh, a, an expert um, authoring your content that you failed. Um, it's, it's Google trying to, uh, to establish um, more, first of all, is this page harmful, you know, um, and that's where EAT is more important for um, what we call YMYL topics, topics regarding your money or your life. So something where people have to make decisions on finances, on um, uh, health on legal conditions, on things that are really important in your life, um, then there are criteria for EAT that Google's gonna consider uh, much more strongly than say somebody who's looking for um, you know, a good poem or uh, other things, you know? Um, and so, uh, so yeah, so every, every single site it's, uh, it's important for. Um, and for some, there are aspects of EAT that are much more important uh, depending on the query uh, than for others, which I'm sure we'll get into some examples examples in a minute. Sure. We'll dive in. Thank you. Uh, Casey, how does Google determine how trustworthy your site is? You're muted, by the way. <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. They basically throw darts. <laughs> no, no, not at all. No. With regards to trustworthiness, Google is really kind of a, a pretty kind of clear about a lot of that stuff. They basically work on um, determining whether or not, uh, as Marie has laid out, whether there are various components that align specifically to the site in question. And then they use those determinations through the quality greater guidelines to train the algorithms and determine and ascertain the bottom line trustworthiness of a site. So 
when we're talking about individual things that whether it's raiders or other people are looking at, we're looking at breakdowns like reputation and authority. Uh, Google is looking for signals that indicate that a website has a positive reputation and is considered authoritative within a specific niche. Uh, for example, I like to, I work a lot in the food blogging niche. So Google specifically is looking for mentions, citations, and backlinks from food related sites that would reinforce the fact that I have some earned authority and expertise in that niche specifically. We'd also be looking at expertise of the main content or MC, which you see a lot as you go through the Google Quality Rater guidelines. That would be things where authors or contributors would be looking and you'd be Google would be looking at your main content to see that it comes through, that your expertise, your qualifications, everything's coming through and that it's reliable. Is the content well-researched? Have I supported it with citations? Is it written by subject matter experts? You'd also be looking for things like transparency and contact information. If a site is very hard to determine if there's someone real behind the site, that's going to lower the perceived EEAT in many cases because it's not trustworthy. I can't find clear and accessible content information. I can't find, for an example, a demonstrated mention. Maybe there's no about me page. And then we get into things like consistency and quality of the content you're writing, user experience and security. I know that Andrew can talk a little bit about that. And even things like user feedback and reviews are all going to go into determining whether or not a site is trustworthy. So all of those together are going to determine how trustworthy you are both to users and to Google in general. Well, you mentioned something about not having an about me page, which brings me kind of to my next question. Andrew, is it no longer possible to run a blog or website successfully anonymously or like just using a first name, for instance? Um, yeah, so successfully is the key, right? Um, <laughs> it's absolutely possible to create a blog that's anonymous or just using your first first name, but, uh, you, you know, people want to know who they're reading, right? So it's it's not just that Google wants to know that it's trustworthy. It's, you're, you're again, thinking of your visitor. If someone comes and sees a blog by Sarah, they're going to be like, okay, great. Who's the Sarah person? If it has her full name, it's a little different, right? Um, I'd say there are some exceptions um, where like, if being anonymous is specifically part of the thing, like back in 2010, um, uh, the website fedupwithlunch.com. It was an anonymous school teacher, right? Who ate school lunch every day for a year. Part of the thing was that she was anonymous and that actually really added to the cachet. Um, and it's Sarah Wu, uh, she's been revealed. But um, so that that contributed, like her, her website went crazy because of the, the whole ethos of it. Um, however, for most people, that's not really gonna help you, right? It's just gonna hurt. Um, and really the bottom line is people wanna know who they're reading. So when I don't see a last name on there, um, I start to wonder, um, you know, who is this person? Why should I be reading this? And, you know, I can't also find third party resources to prove that this person is good either, right? If I have their full name and where they're from or, or, or you know, some other background information, I can do my own homework and decide if somebody is really um, qualified to be giving me this information on the website. Right. Um, Casey, there's a lot of concern for self-taught chefs or bloggers who have um, don't have a professional designation. What's the best approach to presenting oneself as an expert and how important are the about uh, page credentials? Well, I would say that it's not nearly a, biggest, a big an issue um, now as it used to be, though I would say that it's incredibly more competitive to be a successful food and lifestyle blogger now than it was just five years ago. Uh, an about me page is the bare minimum I would expect to see on a site. As a matter of fact, I had someone try to onboard and on the other day, and I literally refused to onboard them because their site was so untrustworthy. I told them that until they were able to fill out a very detailed about me page, link all of their content to a clear author byline on the site and do other little things to prove to me that this was a business and not a hobby, I wasn't going to justify onboarding them for an audit. And that was my personal opinion. But Google, the quality reader guidelines specifically talk about the fact that it is not a detriment to be a home cook when they evaluate expertise, when they evaluate experience, it's on the bottom line quality of the experience or the expertise in question. So a home cook with a decade of experience could easily be treated the same way that a Cordon Bleu graduate would be based upon two specific related recipes, especially if the recipes are both extremely high quality. So our goal, of course, is to always try to push those authority signals on our site by making it easy for someone to understand there is a real person behind there. Uh, and that is certainly going to get much, much harder because you can only rank for, I mean, if you 
uh, if, if, if I run across a blogger and they're only comfortable putting their first name out there, that is going to limit their reach a little bit because you're never going to be the number one ranked SARE in the world. <laughs> so okay. something to be aware of. Very good point. Um, Marie, I have a two-part question. Um, first part, how should bloggers show experience to Google effectively? Um, and uh, are there key elements all publishers should consider? And then um, second part would be, how long does it take to build this on Google? Um, does it take a lot of time? Those are good questions. And I think that the answers to those are going to be speculation. And it, here's the reason why. I, I want to take a little bit of time to sort of explain why we're focusing on EAT. And some of what I'm going to say here is stuff that uh, I haven't really articulated on uh, podcasts or in talks yet. So hopefully it comes out uh, well. I've been spending the last year trying to um, hone down how I uh, communicate this. So we have two documents that tell us how to do, uh, how to demonstrate experience, how to like improve quality in the ways that Google wants to reward. One is uh, a documentation that Google published called Creating Helpful content uh, or helpful and reliable content. Um, and it lays out a bunch of criteria that we first saw when Google released the Panda algorithm back in 2011, and they've modified them slightly. But there are criteria that say things like, um, you know, does this, does the creator of the content uh, have a depth of experience or I'm, I'm rewording these, but um, they're the, the questions that we're paying attention to in terms of EAT. And that's why you're asking, should we have uh, author bios and, and things like that? Um, but those questions are based on a much bigger document, which is called the Quality Raiders Guidelines, which anybody can get online. Uh, Google made it publicly available. They update it regularly. Um, it's a PDF document that I, I can't remember the length now. It's about 170 pages or so. And so to answer this question, the answer is in that document, but there's no one specific answer. And the reason why it's in that document is that Google told us back in when they rolled out Panda. So we'll go back to like 2011. They said, here's the type of questions that we consider when we create algorithms to reward the type of content that users would find useful, that searchers would find useful. And SEOs at the time, like all we knew were a, a rules-based algorithm that we could say, well, what can we work towards? You know, maybe we can trim out thin content or uh, duplicate content. Those were the types of things that we went after to try to improve quality. But we never actually considered that like maybe actually Google could uh, measure the things that are in this document. And it wasn't until um, just a few months ago, really, when uh, last year, Google released this helpful content system. And they gave us the same list of criteria with just a few extra things added on about like AI generated content and, and the value that it's giving and, and stuff like that. Well, it just clicked with me that, oh my goodness, I mean, Google's been using AI. They told us they've been using AI in their search algorithms for many years. They've been an AI first uh, company since 2016, which coincidentally was when the Penguin algorithm uh, stopped, um, was able to ignore links. It's all, it's all connected. Well, um, they use AI to generate, uh, to basically create a model that replicates what's in the quality raters guidelines and what's in the helpful content documentation. So we can talk forever about how does that happen? You know, we can talk about neural networks and we can talk about how machine learning creates this helpful content signal, which says like, is this website likely to produce the most helpful content of its kind? We can get into all those details, but ultimately what Google's trying to model is the advice that they've given us in the Raider guidelines and in the helpful content document. So with all of that uh, in, in mind, which is a lot, like it's, it's really a change in how we think about SEO. I would say that the most important thing for any website, whether you're a food blogger or, or whatever, um, is to try and align with what Google says in those documents. So how should bloggers show experience there's one other document that Google published recently uh, that says, well, we're going to now add experience to the quality raters guidelines. So what I would encourage you to do is to open up the guidelines and do a search for uh, experience. Um, if you're a recipe blogger, do a search for recipe 
um, try to look for, they give loads of examples and they'll say, uh, this site is considered high quality because they're known as a popular recipe site, or they have a reputation for producing high quality, uh, you know, content, that type of thing. And so um, you can see like, this is what Google wants to reward. So how can I model my website so it looks the same? So in terms of showing experience, um, yes, you can put an author bio and you should write in your author bio something that demonstrates that experience. And here's a little tip. You can use ChatGPT or Bard uh, to take your current author bio and say, I wanna rewrite this to better demonstrate my experience on this topic. And then uh, ChatGPT will rewrite your current author bio and uh, and also include like, you know, she's good at this topic and this topic and she's known for, you know, these amazing recipes, that type of thing. And that can help um, to just put more evidence uh, on the online world that says, hey, when you're looking for this topic, this is the website and the blogger that you uh, that you really want to connect with. Um, so your author bio is one thing. Uh, but other things, um, I really think that Google probably looks at the overall, um, I can use a tool like ChatGPT to look at content and say, does this content demonstrate real world experience? And it's going to tell me stuff like, oh, yeah, you know, they actually have a real store or they, you know, they talked about the recipe that they made um, as opposed to what other people have said. Uh, so the verbiage that you use on your website, you really want to show that you're not just summarizing what everybody else says, that like, here's what you, the content creator, the reason why people come to your website, here's what you created. Um, and so that might mean things like adding video. It might mean things like adding images. and the thing, the most important point I would say as, uh, because everybody who's watching this is trying to figure out like, what do I do? What do the best sites do? And how do I copy that? How do I do better? Don't, because this is the problem. We're all in this rut of like, oh, well, this site's ranking with this type of SEO. So therefore I must do the same. Meanwhile, none of us are really optimizing for Google's machine learning algorithms that are uh, trying to actually just figure out what is the best result to show searchers. Um, so anything that you can do to uh, improve, to use your real world experience and improve the content for your searcher has the possibility of um, making your content rank better. Uh, and how long does it take? It takes some time. Uh, like, I mean, unless you're writing on a, a topic that there's very little competition for. Um, I, I had, you know, I've had people over the years contact me and say, I had one guy who said, um, I need some links because I want to create a bank that's going to um, rank against uh, the major banks. And like, there was a time where like, maybe if you had enough budget for link building and you knew the right people who, you know, knew the right ways to build links that maybe you could compete in those spaces. But with EAT now, like, you're not going to be able to fool Google into thinking that you're the best option to show searchers um, unless you've built up your reputation. You've built up, uh, and reputation is so important uh, for food blogs, that's probably, I, I would say, the most important thing is that you are known as the place to go for this type of recipe. Whether you're known for your vegan recipes, for your gluten-free, for your, like, just the fact that you create quick recipes or whatever, you, you need to have a reputation and you need to have people online that are saying like, this is the place to go. And that's how you build experience. Um, and then over time, uh, that type of information gets put into um, Google's databases. It's in the knowledge graph. Um, it might be in, there's something called the shopping graph, which is all information about products and all of the connections in between them. And Google can use all of that information to figure out like, Oh, somebody wants a good chocolate chip cookie recipe. Well, uh, this is the this is the person who's known for making the best chocolate chip cookie recipe. Um, and it's not necessarily because you got a link from all these other bloggers. It's like Google's legitimately looking for signals that say, yeah, you're the best option here. Oh, Arson, a lot so of good. I know. I'm like, my mind is really me and Arson are so impressed. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's good. Um, <laughs> Jeff's kiss. Jeff's kiss. Let's go. Let's go. Um, speaking of reputation, Arson, um, how can the small bloggers compete on EEAT with these more established blogs? I mean, what's your input on that? <laughs> right. So, uh, I mean, uh, Marie kind of like got into this. Um, so the interesting thing, um, and we've talked about this plenty of times, um, 
the, the interesting thing that we're noticing right now is we're doing a study, we have an R&D team, and we're doing a study in the travel, a, a travel blogger vertical. And we started noticing a very interesting pattern, and obviously correlation, causation, all of that stuff. But we noticed that a lot of the space for very competitive queries is being taken up, which is a little bit different than what we see currently uh, uh, in, in the food blogging niche. The top 10 results are typically being taken up by the big players, where in the food niche, in the recipe niche, we can see one or two, typically below position five, can still make it in if the content is really good and you're doing a good job at all of the three things that we always preach about, and that's you know matching the query, satisfying intent, covering the topic, right? Um, in travel, what we're noticing is that the smaller players have to really carve out, and Marie touched on this, a specific topic that they're covering and establishing themselves as experts on. And that topic usually in, in the travel space is, is hyper-local. So where somebody is writing about like, oh, visiting Costa Rica and everything you need to know, somebody who's writing about visiting Austin, Texas, and everything is about Austin has a much easier time ranking, right, for those queries. Um, and it's all about that topical depth, right? Like, owning a topic and we talk about this this is topic clustering this is all that um, so eat is a strong component but eat is a byproduct of your expertise right like what you're going to write about and over time as marie said over time google starts recognizing that and yes there are things you can do to optimize you can definitely do knowledge grab optimization you can do all kinds of stuff get yourself in and kind of include it in places and we'll touch on that a little bit later but the best thing to do if you're if you're in the space and you're covering topics that you're having a hard time competing, you really, really have to establish yourself as an expert uh, uh, in a specific on a specific topic that's a subtopic of a broader one, right? And if you continue to hammer away at that, over time, you will notice that for that particular topic, you're having an easier time ranking. Um, and I'm not going to get into other stuff because we still have more to cover. We'll answer more later. Um, Andrew, this is a really common question among um, some of our attendees today. Uh, should bloggers be afraid of changing or updating the author on their highest ranking posts? I'm so um, I'm confused as to why this is a popular question, because it's I'm like, but you're the one who wrote it. So why would you change the author? Well, so selling selling a blog, maybe. Yeah, selling oh, or okay. buying blogs. Okay, that yeah. makes sense. So. Um, yeah yes, be afraid is the answer. Um, you know, this whole thing is about building trust, right? So if suddenly it goes from Stacy to Steve, uh, that's going to be weird, right? Um, because Steve wasn't the one who wrote the recipe or whatever the post is. Um, so, you know, that has an impact on expertise, on consistency, on trust. You're basically violating the trust, right? Because like, what's the truth here? Um, it can confuse historical signals. Um, so yeah, I think if you're, um, if you've accidentally said like by guest blogger in the past, right, then changing it to who the actual guest blogger is, their actual name and linking to their site on their or their about page, that makes perfect sense because you're increasing trust. But if you're just going to like play a shell game of author names, I think that's just going to hurt you. Be worried and warned. <laughs> <laughs> Um, we warned you. <laughs> shaking fits. Um, Marie, what role does content quality play in building EEAT? Uh, some bloggers are curious about establishing expertise in posts without losing their readers. For instance, like people who just want to get to the recipe and they don't want to hear about how you discovered it. <laughs> yeah, recipe pages are always the, the topic that comes up when we talk about creating helpful content. Because um, in my opinion, the most important thing uh, when it comes to the helpful content system is um, Google tells us to pay attention to page experience. Now, page experience, uh, most SEOs would tell you that that's synonymous with core web vitals, which is, you know, having fast page load times, making sure your page doesn't jump around when searchers uh, want to click on something and accidentally they click an ad. That's important. That's a component of page experience. Um, and it's something that could make your pages maybe a little bit more helpful if you don't have a, a bad experience. But what makes a page the most helpful is when the users can find the content that they went there for. Um, and so uh, think about, you know, the last time you did a search on your phone 
and um, you know, you you pick up your phone, you you do your search, and you find the part on the page that answers your question, and then you move on. Like we don't have, we think we have these magical readers that read every single word that we've written. And so, why do recipe sites write, you know, the whole history of your grandmother's recipe and and you know the the history of uh, of the food and and all of this stuff? I think there's three reasons why it happens. One is because uh, because everybody does it, and so again, we're trying to copy what the best sites do and. And if the sites that are currently ranking have uh, all sorts of extra information, then perhaps we should as well. Two is that there's some um, proof or some reason to do it in that um, one of the most important things when it comes to Google determining which content is relevant is the words on a page. And so if you have a bunch of words on a page that are all talking about the same topic, it can increase the chance that Google's relevancy alg algorithms say, oh, yeah, this page is definitely talking about the subject that that the people want. Now that's important, but it's not as important to getting the searcher to, to the, the, the question, uh, the, the answer that they want. Um, and then I think the third reason why uh, some people, some of the, especially the bigger sites have pages and pages of information before you actually get to the stuff the user wanted. Um, and that's for ad impressions, right? Is uh, That's why uh, most recipe bloggers have uh, websites is, is to make money from ads. And the more you can get people to scroll through your content, the more money you're going to make. Um, so if we think about like what's most, most important, how do you get somebody down to that recipe page? Or like, should you put your recipe at the top of the, the content? I think it's perfectly acceptable to have a jump to recipe button, um, as long as your searchers can find it and they use it. Now, I've seen some of those that you, you tap the button and like, oh my gosh, I got to close this ad and then I got to figure out like, is that the recipe or is that an ad or like, you don't want that. Um, as long as you make it easy to find your content, then uh, that's good. However, I'd like to see some of you experiment with actually just putting the recipe at the top. And for those who are interested, here's the whole life story of my grandmother below, you know, um, because uh, uh, Google has said in several talks in several places that uh, that content near the top, like the important stuff near the top uh, really helps. So, yeah. um, you know, I don't have a lot of case studies. I, uh, maybe Casey. So let's can, let's talk about that, that yeah. real quick. Okay. Before everyone says, oh my God, Marie told me to move the recipe card to the top, just let you know, Lily Ray and I already did this multiple times and the drop in revenue was 70%. Wow. So understand that that is not an appropriate thing to do if your goal is to monetize your site. Now, it makes perfect sense, right? Well, people are looking for the recipe card. I'm going to put it at the top. I've 100% fulfilled my user intent. I've made it extremely easy for people to find my recipe card. The problem is, is what happens? They don't scroll down. So they don't activate a scroll. They don't activate anything below the fold. We don't have anything. Any lazy loading ads pop in and your RPM falls off the cliff and so does your ad income. So whenever we've tested this, clearly, you know, we've even tested putting the recipe card in the middle of the post. Same thing. What happens is that people stop at the recipe card and they don't go to the bottom and see anything below that. So unfortunately, if your goal is to monetize and make this a, a business as opposed to a hobby, we still kind of have to, to be, uh, you know, mm -hmm. we're, we're basically slave to having to put the recipe card at the end of the post. And I just, I just, I just wrote this in the in the chat here, and and uh, I agree with Marie hundred percent. And 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 we talked about this many times on our webinars and and in my coaching. Uh, prioritizing intent. The user is there for a recipe. They're mm -hmm. not there to know is this the best thing or is the uh, 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 Arson's grandma's potato soup recipe right? Like they're there for a specific thing. So you don't have to move your recipe card to the top, but your content should satisfy that intent. So if somebody lands on your page, they shouldn't have three paragraphs of why you're going to love this recipe. You can quickly do a quick blurb of why this recipe is awesome, right? But three, four paragraphs is definitely too much. But prioritize intent. They're there for the recipe. Give them ingredients instructions. Well, that's, what the, teaser, that's what the teaser text right, is. Right, right, the teaser right, text right, is right. there to qualify the content. I mean, you right. if it ain't fit, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Right. When you're talking right. about blogging, so let, let me have... let me talk about that teaser text because I think yeah. I think that's a really good idea, and I totally Very get important. that that revenue uh, will plummet. For uh, I mean, that's the reason why websites um, put all that content there. And I think uh, it would be interesting to look at the balance between you know, does it really hurt user engagement? Because it, like it's not. What's the point if if Google decides that uh, your content is too annoying and searchers don't want to scroll through all those ads? Like it's useless anyways, right? Um, but here's something that can really help again with using a tool like ChatGPT or Bard is take your page that currently exists 
and paste it into one of these tools and then ask, what is the main intent of a searcher who comes to this page? And maybe ask, what are three things that are really important to this searcher? And it might not always be what you think, you know, like it, you think sure. that maybe they want to know uh, the best recipe, but actually the thing that makes your stand out is like that it uses a particular ingredient or something. And then you can ask the tool to write an introductory paragraph um, that satisfies the user that their answer is going to be on this page. So I think that's a good place to start is that the initial, at least above the fold, somewhere in the beginning of your content, uh, there is something that satisfies users that like, okay, I'm not going to have to read through four pages of stuff to get to the recipe. It's there and then have a jump link to the recipe. I think that that would probably be helpful. Yeah. And the, the jump in the print recipe links by far, I, 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 I'm going to single-handedly take credit for those, honestly, because I was literally the most hated person on planet Earth by ad companies from 2019 to 2021 because I was relentless in pushing these out. As a matter of fact, the article in SEM Rush from 2017, which pushed these buttons, is honestly one of the earliest reference to those buttons. And I couldn't tell you the hate mail that I got from ad companies saying, oh my God, you cannot do this. You're going to destroy RPMs. RPMs went up. The reason RPMs went up is that you were making it easy for users to find what they needed on the page. Yeah, it's no. Well, so what I would like to see sites do is experiment with what you can put on that page that actually is helpful to searchers. Like I've read some recipes where, um, you know, there's a little video of each step and I actually go through that or like, so experimenting with stuff that, um, uh, adds your personal experience in a way that like, if here's a, here's a good tip. If you take your recipe or your page or whatever, it doesn't have to even be a recipe page, and you erase everything that exists on other sites, not like word for word, but everything that, yeah, like you could find this combination of ingredients on other sites, like you take everything away and look at the rest, how much of it actually meets searcher intent. You know, um, if, if you're just padding the uh, the page with words so that you can get some ad scrolls like that, that's not good. Um, but if you can come up with ways that you can be like, look, here's a silly video of me doing it that and people actually want to watch this or something that um, people actually find interesting. You know, a really good thing is to do tests. It takes forever, you know, but if you're if you're cooking recipes, I love those tests where people are like, you know, we cooked the eggs and like we cooked this one for four minutes and this one for 10 minutes. And like, here's the difference. That's super helpful right so um you're trying to like put content on the page that people actually want to engage with rather than just trying to come up with words because those words are for search engines which is what the helpful content system is designed to uh, to demote exactly exactly and that brings us again and uh repeat after me and many people know this i know we've got 133 on the call what is the most important phrase that casey teaches during his audits that we're going to have a shirt that we're going to have a shirt on. I'm going to wait for everyone to pop it in. Bacon, candy no, corn. No, not bacon. We always no. write for we always write for toddlers and drunk adults. That is literally right. when everyone is putting a recipe together. If you can write a recipe that is as easily understandable to toddlers or drunk adults, you are well on your way to having a successful way for you to be able to present that content in a way that both Google and users are going to be able to pull out without any any issues. Well, and and that's just something to be aware of. I mean, you can only write so many banana crime banana cream pie recipes and yet you continue to have new banana cream pie recipes mm. every day so how are you going to do it and if you have let's say your website has 800 recipes on it of which four are like super freaking amazing you know they're the ones that people come to you and and then the rest are just ones that like you you padded you got together and and maybe they're not the best of their kind well the rater guidelines um actually instruct the raters to label content as they review it um as low quality, medium quality, medium high quality, quality high SBC, or yeah. fully meeting the needs of searchers. Mm -hmm. And I, I am quite suspicious that if you, they, the way they describe medium level quality uh, content is content that like is, is it serves a beneficial purpose. It meets that purpose, but it's no better than anybody else's. And I think if you have, if the majority of your content is that way, then Google puts this classification on your site that says like, you know, uh, unless like this site is clearly the best answer, let's not even consider that one in ranking. Things. Um, so it's it's so important that what you publish is the best of your stuff that you're not. Uh, and, and I think a lot of people have we've thrown content out just because like, well, let's try to publish as much as we can and see what sticks. And some of that lower quality content could be dragging sites down as well. Well, right. And where that's a that's a and that's a common. I mean, there, there uh, there's only some some absolutes in, in search engine marketing. And one of them is that 
Google grades on an individual post basis, but they penalize at the host level. And that's exactly what you're describing here with this, with low quality content like this. If you've got 800 recipes on the site, which by the way, is a significant amount of recipes for the average site. So just an FYI, you probably 400 is about what I'd be looking at for high quality, honestly. But if you've got 800 recipes, then we know probably right away, 40% of those recipes have quality issues without having to go into depth on anything else. And we want to really and work you can tell to filter those out. Probably a question that people are going to have is, well, how do I know if that is impacting me? Because, you know, how do you know if your recipes are uh, maybe considered medium quality and Google doesn't want to rank them? Um, and it's really hard. They don't give you, you don't get a warning in search console. You don't get like any sort of message that says, hey, uh, there's a helpful content classifier on your site. Um, you basically have to look and see like, did your organic traffic suddenly plummet? And is there uh, no reason why? And there's certain dates that, uh, are important. Like if your traffic dropped on, I'm gonna I'm gonna shout out a bunch of dates here uh, that I think are important. Um, December 5th is uh, when the helpful content update officially happened. Uh, but then there was early November, the 15th of November, uh, and then the first week of January, February, March, April, May, and June. And it, it, I just realized this today when I wrote it all out that the first week of every month seems to be when sites are getting impacted by uh, this helpful content um, classification. If that happens to you, what you'll see is there's a clear date where traffic starts to decline and then it just continues to get worse and worse. Um, as Google figures out that uh, your content isn't the most helpful of its kind. So if that's happening for anyone, um, you know, the, the fix is hard because Google doesn't really tell us. They just say, remove the unhelpful content, which, you know, okay, so if you've got 400 recipe posts, how do you know? Like, do I remove 397 of them? <laughs> like, uh, it's it's very difficult to, to make those decisions. So um, I guess ultimately we should be making sure that every page that we have really is like something that we're super proud to have on our websites. Um, and if you're not sure, then uh, there might be a good room for content pruning. Uh, although that's, you know, something that you need to talk to somebody who knows what they're talking about when you, um, if you're going to prune out content. You can definitely talk to Top Hat Rank about that. <laughs> there you go. Shame, shameless plug. Shameless yes, plug. Shameless plug. Uh, that was so much like valuable information. Thank you both. Um, oh, I want to move on. Uh, Casey, I know we touched a little bit on this earlier, but can incorporating multimedia elements such as videos or infographics improve EEAT? Well, it definitely can. I mean, if you go into the Google Quality Rater guidelines, I know Marie mentioned earlier, you know, type in and search for recipe. Well, if you were to type in and search for video, it's referenced 64 times. And so that's something specifically that the Google Rater guidelines are saying is evaluated as a positive metric for main content, as well as a negative. So when we're looking to add these multimedia elements to our site, I think the biggest takeaway is that they enhance expertise demonstration. When we have multimedia elements, any elements, whether it's uh, videos or video demonstrations or tutorials or infographics, those are powerful tools to showcase demonstrative expertise. You know, so we want to, if we can leverage that on our sites, we should. Now, that being said, I know many of you on the call are food bloggers, and most of you were hit negatively by the video thumbnail update that happened on 413. And what happened there is Google took away the primary video thumbnails for secondary results of the search result, meaning that no longer are you going to get a video thumbnail because the video, as is the case with recipe sites, is never the primary component of the page, the recipe card is. So because of that, we had a lot of bloggers who came in, just bombarded ours and myself, others, with emails because they had lost, in some cases, hundreds of thousands of clicks from April to May in videos. And unfortunately, they're not going to be getting those back. The only way that we could get those back was if you were to set up completely new primary video pages around that. And frankly, that's not worth doing in many aspects because it's gonna cannibalize your existing recipe content. But in many cases, if we can add things like infographics, if we can do maybe non-recipe posts, maybe produce guides or or seasonal planning guides, or if you're in the do-it-yourself niche, if we can add video tutorial steps, things like that, short videos, including TikToks and the like, to your site, that is an exceptional way to showcase expertise, explain cumbersome and boring topics at scale, and provide a way that's more interactive for the average user on your page. So I would, I'm always for that when you can. 
Perfect. Thank you. Um, we've got a few more minutes before we go into our Q&A, so I just want to get through these next few questions. Um, Arsen, how can website owners leverage guest posting and collaborations to boost their eat? <clears throat> so, look, it, it, this is this this is one of those things again this is this is third party validation right so you want to make sure that you're not just doing this for the sake of link building right you're not going to some random sites and submitting guest posts you want to write content and submit content to places that are authoritative that have already established trust bigger brand publications publications that are within your niche and 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 topical expertise right uh, um, and then uh, very important to 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 reference that and to showcase that on your about page and link out to the places where you've written content or contributed content to. Uh, uh, those are those third party validation signals that, that we talk about uh, uh, during our calls that are so important. So it's not just for the sake of link building, it's to help Google connect the dots. This is my blog. I also write on this topic for Huffington Post. Mm -hmm. Huffington Post in Google's eyes is already a, a, a trustworthy publication, right? And if you can link from Huffington Post back, back to your profile, same as mark out on those if needed, if possible, during Google that you are here, this is your about page. When you connect dots for Google, uh, Google can crawl through that and create those connections. And that's how knowledge graph gets populated. That's how things get picked up. Uh, so I would definitely focus on that. I think, Marie, didn't you have a little input on this? Did you want to share? I just wanted to add, I, I've been very vocal about guest posting for links. Um, and that's not what Arson's talking about. Arson's not talking about guest posting for links. He's talking about <laughs> guest posting for brand exposure and for being known on your topics. Um, but it's very hard to to find where that, uh, you know, that line is hard to draw. Um, and so I start, started my start in SEO in, in helping sites remove manual actions when Google had gone after them for um, doing too much manipulative link building. Uh, you're not going to get a manual action these days for guest posting. But if you are doing it as a link building tactic, uh, it can impact you. And um, again, Google's using AI in the form of spam brain uh, to figure out where a site is um, has characteristics that are aligned with uh, what sites do when they're trying to manipulate rankings. So um, if you're guest posting, my, my rule of thumb is um, if you get a link on a, or if you get a mention on a site where you're, where you want to tell your friends, you're like, oh my gosh, I got mentioned on this site, then that's a really good place to guest post. Um, if it's a site nobody's ever heard of, or you're just doing it so that you can uh, pad some numbers to say that you got a few links, then it, it's probably going to, to waste time for you. Thank you. Um, Casey, quickly, uh, what are the risks of neglecting EEAT on a website's overall performance? Well, I think we've covered all those in kind of various degrees today, but uh, just very quickly, the first one would be decreased visibility in the search results. You know, Google's algorithms are designed to prioritize high quality content, trustworthy websites that demonstrate expertise and authority. If we neglect EEAT, we're going to lower those rankings and reduce visibility of our content. We also have a loss of user trust. You know, it plays, EEAT plays a very valuable role in building trust. You know, if I fail to demonstrate expertise and authoritativeness of my content, people aren't going to come back. That loss of trust could also lead to lower user engagement, increased bounce rates, reduced conversions if I sell your product. We also want to make sure that we we police ourselves for our negative user feedback and reviews. You know, when when people are visiting a recipe site and they keep making the recipe over and over again, and even though they're following the directions, it is not coming out per perfect those people are going to be vocal and they're going to leave comments of a negative nature about that recipe. And that, of course, is something that might lower your perceived value in Google specifically. Uh, we also want to make sure that we focus on eliminating or reducing any misinformation or low quality content on our site. Uh, this is very, very common in especially some of the older sites that are gluten free or have very specific health focuses. Uh, every week, I still run across at least one site where they've self-healed themselves because of a diet, whether it's gluten-free or celiac deficiencies or the like. And unfortunately, they've gone a little overboard in, in expounding that on their site. And they always come to me wondering why their posts are not performing as well as their competitor here. And I say, well, because your competitor is linking out and supporting all these health and medical claims and you're not. And those are just little, little, like, little examples there. But uh, we really, really want to focus on that. If you don't remember anything else today, remember this, you know, it, you cannot ignore EEAT on your site, 
regardless of your niche. It doesn't matter if you if you don't you're not in a your money or your life area. Uh, it this is still going to impact every blogger on the site. Just as I mentioned earlier with the quote from um, from Google saying that literally every query that goes through their site, they're evaluating through the lens of EEA TDCs. Too true. <laughs> Marie, uh, can social and testimonials contribute to enhancing EEA teams? Yes, definitely. And if you uh, have time, everybody who's watching this, I'd encourage you to read up on Google's shopping graph and what's in the shopping graph. Um, even if you don't sell products, uh, there's uh, they talk about how um, review information is in the shopping graph. Now, this is about products. And I would assume that there's similar information in the knowledge graph, whichever graph it's in, Google has, they're trying to collect um, the overall picture of what do people say about these businesses, about this website. Um, and one of those ways is uh, most likely, and there's uh, examples in the quality raters guidelines about social media, not just, um, I mean, it's one thing you can go and set up a social media profile so that uh, when people Google your brand name, like they see your LinkedIn page and your Facebook and your Instagram and all that. Um, it's more so that you can make the connections in the social graph uh, to say that, um, yeah, you know, this isn't just a blogger who wrote a few posts. They actually have a following. They actually are popular. Um, and, and, you know, we don't know exactly how Google does that, but they're trying to replicate. They're trying to show like, oh, wow, if you have a big active community that really likes your content, um, then, you know, maybe other people will as well. So um, improving your social uh, presence is something that speaks to your um, your EAT uh, for certain, yes. I know some uh, some viewers are going to say they don't like doing social. <laughs> <laughs> we hear that a lot. <laughs> but um, I, I don't think this is necessarily like mandatory to do social, but it's one more thing that could uh, improve um, your chances of being seen as popular. You know, if you're trying to produce, the only way you could survive by not doing any sort of outreach, social marketing of some sort is by actually having like content that's so good that uh, it stands on its own, which is really hard for recipe sites. Like there's only so many cookies, <laughs> cookie recipes in the world. Um, and unless you have that reputation, uh, you know, it's, it's gonna be very hard uh, for Google's algorithms to say, yeah, like this is actually the best one. They're, they're gonna be looking at reputation signals. Well noted. <laughs> and you can use ChatGPT to help with those captions on social, just in case you're afraid of doing it yourself. Just that's my input. <laughs> um, Andrew, what are some tools or plugins bloggers can deploy to help with uh, eat related uh, signaling on their websites? Sure. So um, if we're talking about tools and plugins, really, it's all about the tech, making sure things are technically correct and working right. Um, so that speaks to the page experience, you know, things like Core Web Vitals. So making sure you're on good hosting, you know, if a site takes 10 seconds to load, that actually breaks a user's trust, right? It doesn't feel like it's of quality. So you can just start with the basics of technical. Um, but then in terms of like plugins, um, Yoast SEO is great. Um, you know, that's going to help with a lot of the schema that helps uh, Google understand your site. Um, and other schema plugins like WP Recipe Maker, you know, the recipe plugins are adding that schema to help um, everything work correctly. Um, if you don't have an author box where your bio is on the bottom of the page, um, you know, some themes may have that built in, but you, if not, you can get an author box uh, plugin that'll drop that in. Um, social sharing, we were just talking about, like a social sharing plugin uh, helps people encourage people to click and share, right? But some of them also still show sharing counts. So if your plugin does that, you can show the share counts. If something's been shared a lot, you know, if it's been shared 20, 10, 20,000 times, showing that number is validating, right? So it's an indicator to the person looking at the page, hey, this has been shared on Facebook 10,000 times. And that's that's really helpful. Okay, um, Marie, um, as we wrap up these questions, um, I'm gonna leave this last one for you. How strong of a role will EAT play now that we have SGE and AI? Hmm. So let me just briefly talk about the SGE because I'm not sure if everybody knows what it is. So it stands for Google Search Generative Experience and it's in beta testing right now. So uh, a number of SEOs, myself included, are, are beta testers where um, we can see what it looks like now. Uh, although I don't know that what it looks like now is exactly what it's going to look like when it, when or if it goes live. So right now what we see is uh, if somebody does a query that triggers an SGE response, um, we get this big uh, colored, like almost the whole search screen um, shows an AI generated answer. 
Now, right now that answer is um, put together, it's stitched together from website content. And a lot of people are upset with that because they might see that like, oh, Google used my website in this answer, used the direct verbatim, the content from my website, and they're not actually quoting or linking to those websites uh, from with, within that answer. Now, I'm suspicious that what we see when it goes live won't be stitched together content. It'll actually be barred, which is, uh, uh, you know, Google's version of chat GPT. Um, and barred is what we need to pay attention to. It's not the SGE. I mean, yeah, we need to pay attention to what the SGE is doing. Bard is uh, something that's been very kind of quiet and in the background because it's not quite as good as ChatGPT yet. Um, and it keeps improving. Uh, it's had issues with hallucinations, with making up stuff. Uh, it, it keeps getting better. And that's the way these tools work is they use, uh, it's called reinforcement learning with human feedback um, to make it better and better and more and more accurate. Well, Bard is going to be integrated across all of Google's products. I expect it'll be in search. Uh, Google Lens very soon. Uh, I don't, it may be even now. Um, you can hold up your phone to a, a meal that you see somewhere and ask and use Bard to ask questions about that meal or to ask, how can I make a recipe that uh, does the same? You know, and so um, the way that, uh, so AI generated answers are going to take a lot of traffic from websites. And that's why. Uh, it's super, super important to have something on your website that um, draws people beyond just the facts. Uh, and so, um, you know, we, I saw in the chat, some people were talking about TikTok and whether, you know, am I going to force you to do TikTok marketing? Y you all should be trying to figure out YouTube shorts. And I know YouTube shorts might seem like, like, you know, nothing compared to some of the audi audiences that people have on TikTok. Um, I saw a thing today that said uh, Google's, Revenue, I don't know if it was for last year, don't quote me on these numbers, but uh, Google's revenue from uh, YouTube short, or from YouTube was almost as much as their entire ad ecosystem uh, for the rest of uh, Google. Yeah, and that, last that, year, yeah. That would not, that would not be surprising, and, um, yeah. Makes sense, right? And they've told us that they're coming up with an update very soon to the helpful content system, which is designed to further reward experience. Um, and uh, they talk about finding their words are hidden gems, hidden gems in search. Now, what this is going to be is uh, what I picture it being is whether it's an SGE answer or some other type of answer, you're going to get an answer that's like, here's what the basics of what you want to know. And then instead of websites, you might see websites, but you're also going to see shorts. You're going to see YouTube videos of if I search for, um, you know, what's the right way to boil an egg or something like that. Uh, you know, I, I can, there's only so many ways to do that, but there are people who have their own little unique ways of, uh, of boiling eggs and maybe they do it with entertainment or maybe they, they do it in a way that like is just way more interesting. Um, that's the type of content that we're going to start seeing uh, ranking. And so I think we're gonna see a big shift from, and I know this is scary for people who make their revenue from websites, is we're gonna see a really big shift in how money is made on the web. Um, and uh, I think we need to pay attention to the creator economy. There's gonna be a big battle between um, YouTube and Twitter. Twitter is trying to get all of the world's experts and content creators to, uh, to create content for eventually what will be their language model, um, you know, and then Google is trying to get all the experts and content creators uh, to, to do it on their, um, their model uh, so they can train their model. And, and it all really comes down to um, can you offer something to searchers that they actively want to seek out and find useful? We can't get away with the old model of let's just create something similar to everybody else and build some links and do some SEO and hope that everybody thinks it's the best. Excellent. Um, I want to save just like the last five, we might go over just a few minutes for Q&A, but um, I wanted to go over some of the uh, live questions that we've gotten. Um, from Mike, uh, for bloggers that are two plus authors, um, what's the best practice for author links, author pages for each author, link to about page with uh, team details? What What's the best approach here, panelists? Marie? I'm sorry, I, I, I didn't realize that was a question for me. I was not paying attention. <laughs> For bloggers that are two plus, um, like a two plus author, uh, what's the best practice uh, for the author links? Should they be creating pages for each author, linking to about page oh. with the team, or what is a two plus author? Like just multiple, multi, 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 multi author site. 
Yeah. Multi-author blog. Oh, I see. Oh, if you have multiple authors. Yeah, yeah. You want, well, there's two ways you could look at it. Um, the Raider guidelines talk about the experience of the, and the, and the expertise of the content creator. So um, if you have particular authors, then you should be building their EAT. You know, you should be having an author bio for everyone. You should be doing what Arson said about using same as schema, saying here's where they've been featured in other places. You know, that's, that's important. Um, but not for every site. And sometimes uh, the reason why people go to a site is not because they know uh, the authors, but because they know the site. Um, you know, I'll get a lot of recipes from all recipes. And uh, I don't really know any of the authors on that site, uh, but I know the brand. I, I, I understand the brand and I know their uh, popularity. So um, I don't know if that fully answers the question, but like you should do all you can to get your authors known unless you have the situation where like your brand is the thing that people come to you for. Um, even then, though, I think I'd still want my authors to be uh, to be as recognized as possible. I'd want them to be speaking at places and, um, you know, not just writing articles in places, but to be like on the news and to be, uh, uh, you know, all over the place doing interviews and anything that gets their name out there in association with their topic. Absolutely. We recently had a consult. consult we recently had a consultation with a a blog that was doing very very well in a sports uh, uh, niche, um, and uh, they the entire site tanked uh, and they couldn't figure out why when we looked at it and I looked at the about page it was a persona that they created this person does not exist that was providing mm. advice on products on sports products the entire site tanked all of the posts it looked to me like a manual action when they, we, we looked at, at, at GSC but when we looked inside GSC there was nothing there so yeah absolutely and there's you know, a lot of advice in the Raider guidelines on on how to represent your authors like it's it's uh, definitely something that um, there's a lot of guidance on that. Right. And I've, I've pasted over a code here from John Mueller from April 2021, where he talks about the process, the concept of reconciliation. Still something very important that a lot of bloggers don't understand is that we don't have to do anything dramatic here. You know, people talk about same mass schema, whereas that people's eyes gloss over. The average blogger just doesn't have to worry about that. Google does a really good job of pulling the reviews and the connections somatically for you behind the curtain, so to speak. So as long as you have one clear about me page, for example, and you've provided clear information, maybe you have links to your social profiles, maybe you have links to some of your best mentions on the web, Google's gonna do a very good job of amalgamating all of that together and putting together a very sophisticated, very knowledgeable persona about who you are. And that is all that they're gonna need to be able to pull out that EEAT. So for all you bloggers, who are bombarding you with private messages about, oh my God, how do I improve my EAT? Focus on that about me page. This is something we cover in the audits. This is something we talked repeatedly in the last several SEO for publishers. Have a quality about me page. Make sure that we've got links to your social profiles. Make sure that you have a nice Q&A there and maybe sure pull out some of your top brand mentions. Relate to users. Your about me page is not for you to send, to spend literally 1200 words talking about your family respectfully it's there to talk about why your site is better than the million of other blogs what is your recipe focus what is it about your maybe if it's related to your background great but what is it about your journey your qualifications that makes your recipes more trustworthy than the many many other options available out there and then we present that <laughs> present that in a very friendly way on the page and you're good to go Sounds good. Uh, let's move through a couple more questions just because we're getting to the end of the hour here and we do want to uh, talk about some additional resources at the end. Um, question from Amy. Uh, do personal photos of the blogger help along with their first and last name on the about pages? I would say so. one or two, but don't put eight. Don't put <laughs> don't put your don't put your entire vacation to California Disneyland on your about me page with photos of you and Mickey and Goofy and all those other things right there. So seven is okay. Yeah. yeah, I would say seven I would say photos plus, is fine. I would say the plus and minus would be two, if you yeah. ask. Me. Okay. There's, yeah, a, there's also a difference. Of, range. There's a difference of putting like your vacation photos with the family. Like one of those at the top, so you look like a real human. And then other photos can be like you in the kitchen if you're a food blogger, like actually cooking something, because then you're demonstrating that you're focused on this, right? It's topical and it's relevant. Or if you're in a restaurant, you know, and you have a chef's coat or something, like there, you can use those pictures to bring personality in, but also continue to prove your expertise and, and experience. Awesome. If you, uh, 
or a business that has a Google business profile, then you should absolutely be adding photos to your business profile as well, because they're being pulled into the SGE right now. Um, and uh, it's amazing what, if the SGE ends up like the way that uh, it is now, it's amazing what kind of control we'll have in it, um, you know, by uh, by showing what photos are in our Google business profile. I'm not sure how, you know, right now, I don't think um, the SGE is showing very many recipe sites. I could get it to trigger for queries, very simple queries like, uh, how to cook broccoli or something then, like that. But uh, yeah, go ahead. And that's, and that's very good. It's great that you're going to have to actually go up and hit the prompt because the only queries that we've been seeing that they're automatically triggered for are things like Beef Wellington. It's triggering things like Beef Wellington because there's a there's a non-recipe relationship to Beef Wellington. There's a historical significance to that. So so the, the, the SGE at the top, the auto-generated is, hey, Beef Wellington is a very common dish, blah, blah, blah. And look at all the historical information. Then it pulls out the three top results it pulls for Beef Wellington are all recipes, Food Network, and Wikipedia. That is not <laughs> great for the average blogger. If I'm trying to make a Beef Wellington recipe, well, uh, the Wikipedia page might be some interesting table conversation, but it's not going to help me make a Beef Wellington. And so we and that's where that you that's might improved. That's where you might have an advantage uh, with YouTube shorts or some type of a video um, in there uh, is, you know, if Google's choosing to rank the authoritative sites, you know, you're never going to be more authoritative than Wikipedia, uh, but right. you can be more helpful. You can be more helpful than Wikipedia uh, by demonstrating experience. Certainly. Well said. Um, I'm going to fit in just one more q and I'm sorry we couldn't get to more today. Um, this last one is from Carrie F. I'm going to summarize. She um, she writes health information articles and she ranks pretty well. She's got a master's degree in public health, but she's curious if um, there's a way to future proof her site for EAT in terms of uh, authorities such as having an MD review uh, articles of hers. Is that helpful? <laughs> I think the answer to that depends on what's happening with her search results right now. So um, right now, if if she's able to rank relatively well for the queries that she's trying to, then I would say keep doing it. You know, just keep keep looking. You the the number one thing that she should be doing is continually looking at what is Google ranking, what is Google preferring, and then when uh, there's this query that. Uh, you think that you should be able to rank for, but like maybe Google's ranking somebody else above you, try to figure out why. And it's really hard because we'll look at our sites and go, well, my site's clearly a better uh, example. Google must have it wrong, uh, but that's what Google uh, ranks. So if uh, they're ranking a site above you, then look at their helpful content guidance. I mean, you can look at all of the QRG, but if you look at that documentation that just has, I think it's about like 20 questions to ask yourself. Um, and usually you can be like, oh, you know what? The site that's ranking above me has uh, maybe the page experience is better or um, it's usually because they get users to their answer more quickly, uh, or maybe, you know, they have a real world type of experience that is hard for me to replicate. Like maybe they actually uh, sell this product in real life to people. Um, and so uh, by looking at what's happening with the search results, that's, that's kind of where to go. Now, future proofing is tough. Like, I don't, I don't think anybody can, uh, can predict. I, I don't think we can, I think we could do this call a year from now and laugh at the predictions that we've made about how AI is going to change search. Because I, I keep saying it's like if I was an expert uh, blacksmith in, you know, shoeing horses, uh, trying to explain how electric cars are going to, you know, change the future. Like it, it's, it's too hard for us to comprehend the changes that we're going to go through. So I don't know the answer to that. I think the way that uh, I'm seeing things go with AI generated answers. If you're focusing on EEAT, you're doing the right things. Um, and as long as you're, uh, as long as people will still seek you out, as opposed to just information out, then you should do well. Um, but if your whole business model is like, I can gather information and collate it in a way uh, that's good, then that's, that's going to be tricky unless you have a reputation for um, you know, for doing that where people are like, oh yeah, you need to go to that person. Uh, so future proofing is hard, but um, staying on top of what the search algorithms are currently doing is, and then, and then try and figure out like what changed and what is Google rewarding that um, that's kind of where I would go. That was amazing. Excellent, <laughs> um, <laughs> excellent answer. Um, just in case people want to find out more or work with you, Maria, do you have any resources that you'd like to share with us um, before we close out for today? 
for sure. My website is mariehaines.com. It's H-A-Y-N-E-S. And um, just today, I've been, I've been working on this for honestly like 10 years <laughs> uh, intensively for the last year. I've been trying to get down my process for um, improving helpful content. And so if you go to my website, I honestly just got it on there like half an hour before this call. Uh, if you go to the books section, you'll see there's a workbook uh, that'll help guide you through the quality raters guidelines, help you through uh, the helpful content questions as well. Um, and very soon I will be opening up my site reviews again uh, and I have a little bit more information coming on that. I probably will be um, giving some access to my whole process that I've been building for uh, for over a decade now in reviewing sites. So uh, pay, uh, stay tuned for that. And then the final thing is I run a newsletter that I've written for uh, for many, many years. Um, it's pretty much my full-time job to stay on top of what's happening with Google, with AI and search and all that. Um, so you can find that at mariehaines.com slash newsletter. Awesome. I subscribe. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> I think we all do. We um, do. We do. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> of course. Um, just closing out, a quick reminder, everybody. We are, well, Casey, Andrew, Arson, myself, will be at the SEO Summit in New York City this fall. It's October 4th through 5th. Um, there's more information available at tastemakerconference.com. Just to, you know, you'll, you'll figure it out once you get there. Um, <laughs> Casey, Andrew, um, I know you guys are working on workshops and curriculum. So any, any other details you want to share? Yes. Yeah, I'm, in charge so of, I'm in charge of the after party. Uh, I'm, <laughs> I'm in charge after I'm in charge of the entertainment. And I guarantee you that we are going to have some very good meetups, both nights. Some of that will be legal. I cannot share any more details <laughs> than that. Okay. During I just the want event, to make sure we yeah. have, we have, we have, uh, uh, we have a, a bunch of really good speakers. Uh, we're getting everybody's pictures in order so we can announce them hopefully next week. Uh, uh, amazing lineup. The curriculum includes AI. Curriculum includes everything you need to know. Twenty twenty three and beyond. Uh, definitely uh, something that if you're if you are serious about SEO and you want to learn, this is the place to be. Uh, check it out. Uh, Andrew just posted a link. I saw it there. Uh, um, you know, subscribe to the email list if, if if they have one there. Stay on top of everything. Yes, I'm excited. Woo woo. <laughs> well, everybody, I know we couldn't get to everyone's questions, but we will share them with answers in the recap on our site uh, next week. Check back in on Wednesday. Um, and thank you again, Marie, for joining us, and everyone else. Always. Thank you, Marie. Yes. Thank you for Thanks, having Marie. me. The Great. best. The best. Aww. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. -bye. Bye.